Hello, and thank you for listening to the history of Churchill. I'm sorry, the history of World War II podcast. Episode 86, Risks and Rewards, Redux. As Winston returned from his adventure in northern India, he found that his articles did not make him a celebrity back in Bangalore. In fact, it was quite the opposite. His brother officers, as well as his superiors, found it distasteful that a mere subaltern should openly, if at all, criticize his betters. And that is what Churchill did in his dispatches. Besides vividly telling the tale from the front, he excused himself in not excusing the mistakes, as he saw them, of those around him. He wrote of the new and powerful eek dum bullets called dum-dums, the British used against the natives. His commanders at Simla in India would rather this kind of information not be made public. The British and most other European powers had an incredible technological advantage over the natives they were trying to subdue. No point in explaining in graphic detail what their latest bullets did to the flesh and bone of their victims. He also wrote of the jeopardy local British civilians were placed in during engagements, of British retreating tactics, as if the British soldiers ever retreated, and the poultry rations given to soldiers on long marches. This challenging of established practices ruffled many feathers. By October 21st, he was able to say to Jenny, quote, Once again, I write to you from my old table and my own room here in Bangalore. Unquote. Disappointment was waiting for him. He went through what copies he could of the Daily Telegraph and found his articles under the byline of, quote, from a young officer, unquote. He wrote to his mother not only of his shock and disappointment, but that by not attaching his name, the entire exercise was a waste, one that almost cost him his life. But not unexpectedly, he just focused on the wasted opportunity. Jenny wrote back that the editor talked her into this decision, to which Winston replied, quote, I have written them with a design, a design which took form as the correspondence advanced, of bringing my personality before the electorate. If I am to do anything in the world, you will have to make up your mind to publicity and also to my doing unusual things. Of course, a certain number of people will be offended, unquote. But this time, and it wouldn't be the last, it was Jenny who was in the right. She understood these matters better than her impatient son. She made sure those that mattered, from the Prince of Wales on down, knew who the young officer was. Winston then learned another lesson, that time does not change for any one man, no matter his pleas or plans. As correspondence took three weeks to get from Britain to India, it was only by November that the anxious author was able to read and realize the impression his articles made. His response was cool, at least on the outside. Quote, I am very gratified to hear that my follies have not been altogether unnoticed. Unquote. And finally, there was one more lesson for Winston to learn. But honestly, this was one simple truth that he would never fully grasp. Besides the details of his articles that allowed those safely away from the battles to enjoy the drama, his writing, though at this point in his development he borrowed heavily from Macaulay and Gibbon, was something fresh and appreciated for its own merits. But this completely escaped the young Churchill at the time. He believed that only by putting himself in danger could he impress the electorate and those conservatives he would need to ally himself with. But in reality, the danger was something that impressed him more than others, if only because he saw himself as a coward, as he had expressed to his brother Jack. But the only thing worse than a coward was a metal hunter, a self-advertiser, a thruster, and that's how Churchill's peers now saw him. Why should he be able to criticize those who outranked him, or army policy? How did he get so much leave? Why was he writing for a newspaper while wearing the uniform? Be a writer or be a soldier, but not both. But Winston wasn't worried about his long-term military career. He wasn't planning on staying in the army long enough for his brother subalterns to get back at him 
once they were promoted. He needed to keep moving towards his goal, Parliament, and the best way to do that was to cover another battle. Sir Benton Blood tried to pull Winston's chestnuts out of the fire by asking for him to be appointed his new orderly officer. But the adjutant general in Simla, who was just as angry as those in Bangalore, refused the request. Then, through Jenny's entreaties, the Daily Telegraph, realizing they had something here, made Winston a permanent correspondent. But this mattered little, as those in command would not let him near another conflict. Quote, the Simla authorities have been very disagreeable to me. They did all they could to get me sent down to my regiment. I invite you to consider what a contemptible position it is for high military officers to assume to devote so much time and energy to harrying an insignificant subaltern. It is indeed a vivid object lesson in the petty social intrigue that makes or prevents appointments in this country. Unquote. Of course, his response to all this was to declare to his mother, quote, talk to the prince about it, unquote. and she did. That did the trick. Soon after, Winston was gazetted to the staff of Sir William Lockhart, who was preparing a punitive expedition in the Tara, the Afridi and Oruz Kazai tribes of modern-day Pakistan, were causing trouble. Winston could see for himself how fortunate he was, and for once acted accordingly. Quote, I behaved and was treated as befitted my youth and subordinate station. I sat silent at meals and only rarely asked a tactful question, unquote. How that must have hurt. But it all came to nothing as the local tribes sued for peace. Churchill soon found himself back in his uniform on a train for Bangalore. Seemingly against his will or hope, peace, or at least non-resistance, was breaking out all over the frontier. This left Winston to wield his only other weapon, his pen. He mulled over a few ideas. He could finish his novel, he could start a biography on Garibaldi, or perhaps a short history on the American Civil War. He certainly had heard many stories from his mother's side of the family. But really, the decision had to be made in terms of money. As he wrote to Jenny, quote, the pinch of the matter is we are damned poor, unquote. In that vein, he sent to Jenny a short story he had already completed. Along with his story, he advised his mother, quote, I think the Paul Mall would like it and would pay my price. You should not get less than 20 pounds for it, as it is a very good story, in my opinion, unquote. But his first major effort was already on its way. Not that Winston thought much of his prospects. He had worked five hours a day for two months, taking his recent dispatches and turning them into a proper book. The title, The Story of the Malacond Field Force. It was sent off to Jenny to find a home. But first, it had to be cleaned up and passages verified. This task fell to Winston's Uncle Morton, but it would have been in Churchill's interest if it had not. Still, another writer was working on a book of the same subject, so speed was of the essence. Hence, Morton got to work, as best he could. Again, it was Jenny's time to shine. Instead of dragging the manuscript from door to door, she sought advice from someone in the know and was told to check with A.P. Watt, a literary agent. Watt negotiated the details with a publisher, and in March of 1898, Malacant went before the public with its 200 misprints. Winston was horrified. Thanks a lot, Uncle Morton. Quote, as far as Morton is concerned, I now understand why his life has been a failure in the city and elsewhere. Unquote. Still, his uncle's lack of attention to detail notwithstanding, Winston's book sold 8,500 copies in nine months. It cost each reader six shillings, and Churchill's royalty was 15%. So, in a short matter of time, Winston earned more money, 382 pounds, than he could or would if he stayed in the military in four years. And there was more good news. In between the scathing reviews concerning the book's chaotic punctuation and creative substitutions for real words, 
Review after review spoke of this exciting new talent and his descriptive ability, when the words were in their correct order. Winston, thinking only of money and notoriety, was pleasantly shocked. Quote, I had never been praised before. The only comments which had ever been made upon my work at school had been indifferent, slovenly, bad, very bad. Now, here was the great world with its leading literary newspapers and vigilant erudite critics writing whole columns of praise, unquote. And although Winston's world centered around, well, himself and his goals, when he received a praising letter from the Prince of Wales concerning Malachan, he felt lifted. But in one aspect of his praise, His Royal Highness missed the mark. He assumed Winston's goal was to be in as many campaigns as he could, to rise through the ranks. It's true that Winston wanted to be in the thick of it, but as a correspondent, making more money than any of his brother officers, while simultaneously making a name for himself. And he knew where he wanted to go next. Sir Herbert Kitchener had been working slowly but methodically for the last two years to retake the Sudan. As he went, he made sure a railroad was built behind him, thereby assuring his supplies. No point in having superior technology if you're not going to use it against a foe that outnumbers you and was far away from any established secure base. And in April of 1898, when Kitchener's forces had beaten 16,000 dervishes at the Atbara River, it seemed as if this battle for this large trek of land south of Egypt was about to end. Winston had to be there. Enter Jenny and her connections. Quote, you must work Egypt for me, unquote. He then went on teaching his mother a lesson in tactics. Quote, you have so many lines of attack. Now, I beg you, have no scruples, but worry right and left and take no refusal. It is a pushing age, and we must shove with the best, unquote. But here, Winston had outfoxed himself. His book, along with upsetting many in the military in India, had equally offended Kitchener, and for the same reasons. The Nile was shut to the young would-be correspondent. Or, as Churchill later noted, it was a, quote, case of dislike before first sight, unquote. And as much as Jenny had done for her eldest son, the efforts she went to now to obtain this for him made everything in the past pale by comparison. She visited everyone she knew connected with the army, the entire war office, but of course, only those that mattered, even writing Kitchener himself the Egyptian commander-in-chief, or Sirdar, as he was called. But she came up empty-handed. Simply, the Sirdar had the final say. It was his campaign, and he said no. Then, proving that Winston and Jenny were cut from the same cloth, she moved her base of operations in this campaign to Egypt. But being Jenny, when she checked into the Cairo's Continental Hotel, she did so with her current lover. Major Carl John Ramsdead. Life does go on, you know. But again, she was stymied on this front, as well as another one, much closer to home, or rather, her hotel room. Returning early one day, she found her lover in bed with Lady Robert Maxwell, the wife of another army officer. Hearing of this, the Prince of Wales Yes, he heard everything of this nature, as he was at the head of the British social circles. Well, he was the head. Wrote to Jenny, quote, You had better have stuck to your old friends than gone on your expedition to the Nile. Old friends are the best. Unquote. This podcaster must admit here, His Royal Highness is growing on me. Winston, hearing of his mother's debacle, decided to take measures into his own hands. On June 18th, he left Bombay and made straight for, as best he could, for the war office. But there he found many other equally anxious young men wanting to join Kitchener. This was, after all, a major war, one that looked like another victory for the empire. And many others had a career to advance as well. Winston, like Jenny, got nowhere. That is until... Out of nowhere, Winston received a letter from the private secretary of the Prime Minister himself, Lord Salisbury. He had read and enjoyed Malacan and wanted to speak with the author. 
So, on July 12, 1898, the young Winston met with the leader of the British government and was told how his book had taught the leading politician more about frontier fighting than any parliamentary debate. The meeting ended with Salisbury saying, quote, If there is anything at any time that I can do which would be of assistance to you, pray do not fail to let me know. Unquote. Well, as soon as Winston got back to Great Cumberland Place, he put pen to paper. Quote, I am very anxious to go to Egypt and to proceed to Contorum with the expedition. It is not my intention under any circumstances to stay in the army long. Unquote. Winston wasn't going to make the same mistake he had made with the Prince of Wales. He was putting his case out there, and Salisbury had no problem with pushy young men stating their intentions. Now, as to the hows, whys, and don't mind if I don'ts, yes, I borrowed that from Black Otter, of how Winston made it to Egypt, it went something like this. When a young officer of the 21st Lancers, a regiment of the English cavalry, died in Cairo, the war office, when informed of his death by Kitchener's staff, replied that another officer would be on his way as a replacement. This is when Lord Cromer, the consul general in Egypt, not made of the same stern stuff as Kitchener, gave in to the combined pressure and agreed to send Winston. Again, the details are funny, but clearly Winston's meeting with Salisbury played a large role. When Kitchener found out, he simply shrugged his shoulders. After all, he did have more important things to worry about. Winston received his orders that he would be attached as a supernumerary lieutenant to the 21st Lancers for the Sudan campaign. He was to report to the Abbasiya barracks in Cairo. The downside was that he would have to pay for his own way there. So he borrowed money from an insurance policy left to him by his grandfather, got Oliver Borthwick of the Morning Post to pay him 15 pounds for each dispatch, and set off. That is, he literally disappeared. Bangalore had no idea where he was, and probably wouldn't be able to find out, at least any time soon. On August 2nd, Winston had made it to Cairo. He found the barracks, then found out he was attached to a squadron of the 21st Lancers, and bought a charger for 40 pounds. Soon, they were embarked on a troop transport and paddling by steam upriver. The journey was pleasant, but slow. Along the way, he found out that the 21st Lancers had never seen action in their entire history. The motto, Thou shalt not kill, was foisted upon them. That was about to change. Strangely, for all this build-up, the eminent clash between Kitchener's forces and those under Abdullah M. Mohammed, the successor to the Mahdi, whose forces had butchered Chinese Gordon and his men 13 years ago, the real target and enemy of the British were the forces of France, stationed at Fahoda, now Kodak, further south along the Upper Nile. The French wanted to build a dam there and deny the powerful, life-giving river to the British. The Khalifa and his people had the great misfortune to be stationed in between the oncoming British and the waiting French. Not that the Khalifa was too worried. He had become a popular leader of late, and his people's belief in the Koran and the Prophet Muhammad was absolute. They would do what was necessary to protect their land. Besides, it usually came down to numbers. Kitchener had 20,000 men, which included the Egyptian Camel Corps and the Sudanese, who were rumored to be unhappy participating in this campaign. The Khalifa had 60,000 men in arms. But those arms were the problem. Hi, I'm Nathaniel Lloyd, host of Historical Blindness, the podcast about historical mysteries, myths, and frauds. With so many working from home these days, we become our own taskmasters, making ourselves feel guilty about taking any time to have a bit of fun when we think we should be doing something productive. The truth is that self-care increases productivity, and taking a little break here and there to enjoy yourself can make you more focused when you return to the tasks you've set yourself. Good thing the puzzle adventure game Best Fiends is always within reach, so that you can reward yourself with some hard-earned fun. 
I find time to play between tasks as a palate cleanser when I need to shift gears. I'm only on level 143, but there's always so much new content, new characters, and new seasonal events. There's an endless supply of fun to inject into my day. You've earned your fun time. Go to the App Store or Google Play to download Best Fiends for free. Plus, earn even more with $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Innovative weaponry like magazine rifles and Maxim guns made the British numbers more powerful than they really were. Whereas the Arabs were equipped with out-of-date rifles, passionate chants, which bullets ignored, and passages from the Quran attached to banners, which again meant very little to oncoming bullets and artillery shells. Winston and A Company took at least two weeks to catch up to Kitchener's main force as they altered between traveling by river and military train. During the journey, Winston wrote descriptively of the surrounding beauty. He was surprised, as he told his readers, of the lack of resistance from the Arabs as they made their way south. Quote, usually the game gets warmer by degrees, unquote. But no resistance was offered. In all honesty, Winston was more worried about his personal war with the Sirdar rather than the Arabs. By August 27th, all the Anglo-Egyptian forces were together, along with their nearby gunboats sitting on the Nile, just south of the Shabluka Hills. And as they were coming on their final approach, they slowed their pace, covering just under 10 miles a day. The troops marching in the heat appreciated this military decision. On September 1st, the 21st Lancers, posted ahead of the main body, acting as scouts, were the first to view the city of Amdurman. It was located on the western side of the Nile, across from Kentorm, and as the Khalifa's stronghold, this is where he would have to stand or surrender. Winston couldn't help but notice the hundreds of vultures circling overhead. This he did not appreciate. Just then, another subaltern yelled, quote, Enemy in sight! They haven't bolted! Unquote. Some of Winston's brother officers were fearful that there would be no contest. Churchill squinted in the direction of his comrade's extended finger, and there, about three miles away, was a ridge, in between themselves and Obdurman. On it, Winston could see black dots, which he surmised were dervishes, the name of the locals about 3,000 of them. Just ahead of the men appeared to be a zareba, or hedgehog, made of thorn bushes. This was standard practice, so as to prevent anyone walking up on the men en masse when they rested at night. Later that morning, around 11 a.m., as the lancers continued to watch their enemy, they noticed what they had guessed was a ridge the men were on started to move en masse. The ridge turned out to be more men wearing darker colors. The mass of men came on. Its line was five miles long from left to right. Now that the sun was up, its light caught their spear tips. It looked to Winston like, quote, a sparkling cloud, unquote. Then the colonel of the 21st called Churchill over and told him to report the sighting to the Sirdar personally. Winston gave the oncoming enemy one last look and mounted his horse. Being careful not to exhaust his animal, he covered the six miles back to the main infantry body. As he was to meet Kitchener, he composed his thoughts, hoping to win a grudging respect from the overall commander. As he approached, he took in the Anglo-Egyptian force before him. Five solid brigades in open columns, the Camel Corps on his left, to his right, 70 or 80 gunboats resting on the river. Coming upon the Sirdar, he gave his report, but not his name, simply saying he was an officer with the 21st. Kitchener gave no impression of knowing who the young man was and asked how long he had before their forces came together. Winston calculated the enemy's speed and their distance. Quote, you got at least an hour, probably an hour and a half, sir, even if they come at their present rate. Unquote. Kitchener dismissed the young officer. 
Just then, the Chief of Intelligence, Sir Reginald Wingate, who clearly recognized the young subaltern, invited Winston to lunch. Apparently, the enemy could wait. So, as 60,000 enemy troops jogged towards them, Wingate had a white picnic cloth spread out, and the two men ate with forks and knives. And as they ate, they watched the infantry form up in a defensive arc, while the leading brigade constructed a protective hedgehog from thorn bushes. As they were very near the river, at the end of the lunch, a young man yelled at Winston from one of the boats, quote, How are you off for drinks? We've got everything in the world on board here. Can you catch? Unquote. He then tossed Winston a bottle of champagne. There was no fighting that day, as the dervishes had stopped their approach. But Kitchener wanted this engagement brought on soonest, so he had his howitzers shell Omdurman. Winston returned to his regiment, and they all slept inside the protection of the thorn bushes. The next morning, at 4.30 a.m., the 21st bugles sounded, and Churchill and the others mounted up. When there was enough light, the 21st, who would be Kitchener's eyes that day, spotted the enemy. Winston later wrote, quote, This is an hour to live, unquote. They mounted the ridge near the river and surveyed the enemy. The ridge had been christened Heliograph Hill, and from it, Winston sent his first message back to the Sirdar. It was 5.50 a.m. Quote, Dervish army, strength unchanged, occupies last night's position with their left well extended. Their patrols have reported the advance, and loud cheering is going on. There is no Zariba. Nothing hostile is in between a line drawn from Heliograph Hill to the Mahdi's tomb and river. Nothing is within three miles from the camp. Winston S. Churchill, Lieutenant 4th Hussars, attached 21st Lancers. Unquote. A heliograph is a device that bounces beams of light at a particular target and, using Morse code, allows messages to be sent over long distances. Winston then climbed higher for a better look. No more than 400 yards away, the nearest defensive squares of the Khalifa's men stared back at Winston. He later wrote, quote, Talk of fun, where will you beat this? Unquote. Then the closest Arabs started shooting at him. The sand kicked up all around him. Soon a corporal came up to Winston as the Sirdar wanted another report. Winston sat down and wrote, quote, About one fourth Dervish army is on their right, which they have refused at present. Should this force continue to advance, it would come to the south side of Heliograph Hill. Most of the cavalry are with this force, unquote. He later wrote of this moment, quote, The fire was for the time being as hot as anything I had seen, barring only those ten minutes with the 35th Sikhs a year ago today, unquote. The enemy was now coming, still in their protective squares, but there were so many of them. It looked like waves coming ever closer, quote, the tide was rising fast. One rock, one mound of sand after another, was submerged by that human flood. It was time to go. Unquote. However, Winston stayed there until he was ordered back by a major. Winston's last glance told him that the Khalifa was going to use every man he had, hoping his numbers would negate any technological advantage held by the British. Then the Arabs started running at the invaders, screaming as they came on. But then, owing to a dip in the land, their front units disappeared, their screams muted, only to rise again, now much closer and louder. And before them were the men of Kitchener, standing shoulder to shoulder. But the two forces never met. Just then, the Sirdar's guns opened up. Four batteries of howitzers, shells from at least 70 gunboats, and the dum-dum bullets from the Lee Enfields held by the Egyptian infantry in front. And within minutes, 7,000 dervishes fell, still 700 yards away from the Anglo-Egyptian front line. Kitchener, sensing this was the moment, had his five brigades move into echelon formation and readied them to march into the city. This action, if successful, would put his forces in between the city and the Khalifa's forces. They would have to retreat into the desert, a sure-fire death sentence. 
But although suffering heavy casualties, the dervishes still vastly outnumbered their opponents. So the Khalifa's commander had his men reform and launch themselves again at the Anglo-Egyptian force. This time, through speed and numbers, they made it to within a hundred yards of Kitchener's front line and lost another 20,000 men for their effort. Still, they outnumbered their enemy, and Kishner did not want them to make their way back to Omdurman, as the result would be house-to-house fighting, which would negate his artillery. They had to be pushed away from the city, and that was the cavalry's job. Using the heliograph, Kishner had the 21st Lancers, who were in the perfect location for this task, move out. Their orders were, quote, Advance, clear the left flank, use every effort to prevent the enemy entering Abdurman. Unquote. So the stage was set for Britain's last great cavalry charge, and Churchill, about to lead his 25 troopers, was among their number. They started off at a walk, but then kicked their mounts as the bugle sounded trot, then silence. Except for the jingling of the harnesses, all else was a perfect quiet. That is, until they were 300 yards away from the Arab line. Then they fired a volley at the oncoming cavalry. Immediately, three horses and several more lancers fell. This action changed the colonel's mind, who was going to outflank the enemy infantry and push them away from the city. Instead, he decided to run right at them. So, after the bugle sounded right wheel into line, the men knew they would soon be galloping into the enemy line of about 150 dervish riflemen. Winston, seeing their number, decided his Mauser pistol would serve him better than his sword, so returned it and pulled out the gun. This was a bit tricky at a full gallop and with his injured shoulder, but he managed it. When he looked back up, he saw what should have been the end of his life and the lives of every man with him. The dervish riflemen had been standing in a line rather loosely, but their billowing clothes and flags had camouflaged the reinforcements that had just arrived. So now the 21st Lancers, all 310 of them, were charging full speed into nearly 3,000 men, some with spears, other with rifles, and some on horseback. The initial collision was stupendous, charging horse ramming into a wall of human flesh. At that moment, 30 lancers went, as Winston put it, quote, arse over tip, unquote. But also, some 200 dervishes fell as well, by the momentum of horse flesh. Whether they would or could rise was yet to be seen. And then something amazing happened. Although each side was a participant in the scene, they were all overwhelmed by what had just happened, and for about ten seconds after the initial crash, both sides just stood there, staring at each other. Then, coming back to their senses, the British officers who had fallen off their mounts climbed on once again, and once again the Arabs charged with guns and spears, yelling as they came. The trance was broken. British and Egyptian horsemen were being pulled off their mounts. Horses had their legs attacked by swords. Their riders stabbed over and over as they fell. Winston started firing his gun, but as the men were so close, or charging right at him, he ended up shooting several in the face, or his barrel was jammed into some part of their body as it went off. Some of the dervish riflemen purposefully stayed back to attempt to get a clear shot at the horsemen. Winston saw several Martini Henry muzzles pointed at him as their flash went off. His reaction, quote, For the first time that morning, I experienced a sudden sensation of fear, unquote. As he was the lone British officer in his immediate area, he received the attention of all the nearby riflemen. So he ducked down, touching his pommel with his body, and rode in the direction of his own troop that he had just spotted. 200 yards away. They had stayed more or less together and were forming up for another charge. As he reached his men, an Arab literally came out of the sand and lunged at Churchill. He had been lying in wait, his entire body covered with sand. Winston managed to shoot him, but only after the swordmen had made it to within a yard of his horse. This was Winston's last bullet, 
he put in a new magazine. Later, he wrote to Jenny, quote, The pistol was the best thing in the world, unquote. As the men readied themselves for another charge, they lined up and looked at their destination. Then they all, to a man, stopped dead in their tracks. A collective cry stuck in their throats. I'll let Winston tell you what they saw. Quote, a succession of grisly apparitions, horses spouting blood, struggling on three legs, men staggering on foot, men bleeding from terrible wounds, fish hook spears stuck right through them, arms and faces cut to pieces, bowels protruding, men gasping, crying, collapsing, expiring. Unquote. They got to what wounded men they could reach and gave them assistance. And perhaps seeing this macabre sight up close, the colonel remembered that his men did, after all, have guns. So they took their wounded 300 yards away and began to shoot at the dervishes. As the Arabs did not have that many guns and seemed to be poorer shots, they left the field, heading back to the main body. The lancers moved up and broke their fast on the contested ground. Later, Winston found out that the Lancers had lost one officer, 20 men killed, four officers, and 45 men wounded, 119 horses wounded, and all this in 120 seconds. The Lancers had suffered just over 22% killed or wounded, while the overall Kitchener force suffered around 3%. Still, the Khalifa outnumbered his enemy and desired to fight. He had the city's war drums beaten, his single Krupp gun fired, and screamed at his people to fight until the end. They agreed to this last part and collectively decided the end had come. They ignored their leader. As Kitchener approached Abdurman, he was met by three city leaders. They knelt and gave him the key to the city. Hey everyone, Ray here. History is replete with humans overcoming adversity. Yet one of the most horrific disasters, and those that it affected, has largely been forgotten. That being the Great Mississippi Flood. From Wondery, American History Tellers is a podcast that explores extraordinary events from our nation's past and brings them to life. And the story of the Great Mississippi Flood launches their new season. In the summer of 1926, the American Midwest experienced rainfall like no one could remember and all that water had to go somewhere, that being the mighty Mississippi. By the time the rain stopped, some 27,000 square miles were underwater. Crops were destroyed, getting around was practically impossible, and hundreds of farms and entire communities had been washed away. This included now 600,000 homeless Americans and another thousand dead. And when you add on the racism, exploitation, and betrayal that followed, the American landscape would be changed forever. Listen to American History Tellers on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen one week early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Churchill, being a Victorian through and through, tried to justify the unnecessary casualties of the 21st Lancers. He wrote that it might not have made a difference in the battle, which was certainly true, but it showed the people of the British Empire and of the world that the sons of Britain were still mighty and could look death in the face. It was a very expensive gesture. To the disgust of many, including Churchill, Kitchener was not the British gentleman soldier he professed to be. He ordered that the Mahdi's tomb be destroyed the corpse defiled, and the head removed and placed in a kerosene can. Later, when Lord Cromer heard about this, he had the head returned and the body reinterned. Winston, the correspondent, seemed to have learned little from his Malachan episode, or perhaps he didn't care because he knew he wouldn't be in the army that much longer, wrote of the atrocities committed by British soldiers. Kitchener, already angry about the Mahdi's head, seethed with hatred. He personally put Winston in charge of the wounded camels being marched back to Cairo. Churchill, his writing done, simply tore up the orders and took the first boat back to Cairo, letting the camels make it back as they may. 
Winston the correspondent may not have learned when to pull back his pen, but Winston the growing politician was learning. He predicted, rightly, as Kitchener headed further south to meet the French, that, quote, the Battle of Fashoda will be fought in Westminster, that tempers rather than lives will be lost, and ink rather than blood expended, unquote. And so it was. Almost a week after Kitchener met with Captain Marchand and demanded he leave, the French foreign minister ordered the troops to vacate. Paris at the time was torn apart by the Dreyfus affair. Still, Britain knew that saving face was important. So they offered the French a part of the Sahara Desert. That was how it was done under Victoria. Through all of this, Winston did not receive a single scratch. He had killed and wounded, but his uniform and his horse were equally unblemished. That is, until he was floating down the Nile, heading for Cairo. On board the boat was another of the Lancers, a fellow subaltern, who had made the charge with him. He had received a nasty sword cut above his right wrist, and the doctor on board told him he would need a skinned graft. When Winston heard this, he simply rolled up his sleeve. The doctor was agreeable to this, but warned Churchill it would feel like he was being flayed alive. Later, Winston wrote, quote, My sensations as he saw the razor slowly to and fro fully justified his description of the ordeal. Unquote. Winston's new scar, he predicted, would help him get more votes. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. Um, there are two more passages I want to share with you from Churchill. Uh, one is very entertaining, and the other one is beautifully moving. Um, so I want to read those to you. But before I do, I want to thank a couple people. First of all, I'd like to welcome aboard the newest members, uh, Leonard G. from Sand Springs, Oklahoma, and Andrew E. from Victoria, Australia. And I'd like to thank those who donated, Sarah H. from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Jim E. from Portland, Oregon. And Jim, I just want you to know that as I am going to the beach on the second week of September, and it's my birthday as well, I have to admit in the interest of full disclosure that a part of your large donation, thank you very much, uh, may go to cover a bar tab or two. So I hope you forgive me. Thank you very much. And then I'd like to thank Alexander S. from Zurich, Switzerland. And I just have to mention this. Um, I would like to thank Carmen S. Not only is she a member of the podcast, but she makes uh, donations on a regular basis. And somehow through everything, I missed her. So I just want to say, Carmen, I am so sorry. I apologize. And when you told me that you were listening to the podcast when you were at Disney World at the Fort Wilderness Resort, I couldn't help just sit there and think, World War II, Disney. Hey, sure, why not? But I hope you had a good time, and thank you for listening, and thank you for your uh, for your membership and donations. So again, I am really sorry. And again, one more time, the um, the tour um, page should be on the website soon. Paul Finch is working really hard on it. He does have a full time job. He is newly married, and he has his own podcast, Trekmate, previously in the Alpha Quadrant. So he's a little busy, but I do know that it's taking. Uh, place next March and the details should be up there soon and we're going to go to all the places we were going to go to last year so if you can find that old episode I'm sorry I don't know the number but I, I gave a detailed account of all the different places that we're going to so that should be up soon as soon as we can get everything together so here's the first of two passages I wanted to read from Churchill's unequaled pen when he described the process of writing a book it went like this it is an adventure. To begin with, it is a toy and an amusement. Then it becomes a mistress. Then it becomes a master. Then it becomes a tyrant. The last phase is that just as you are about to become reconciled to your servitude, you kill the monster and fling him to the public. This next passage shows his growing skill with his pen and his ability and temperament to criticize those even of superior rank, people he felt were in the wrong. And with his skill, he wanted to praise the slain Arabs that he had just fought. When the soldier of a civilized power is killed in action, his limbs are composed and his body is borne by friendly arms reverently to the grave. 
the wail of the fifes, the roll of the drums, the triumphant words of the funeral service, all divest the act of its squalor, and the spectator sympathizes with, perhaps almost envies, the comrade who has found this honorable exit. But there was nothing doque et decorum about the dervish dead, nothing of the dignity of unconquerable manhood. All was filthy corruption. Yet these were as brave men as ever walked the earth. The conviction was borne in on me that their claim beyond the grave, in respect of a valiant death, was as good as that which any of our countrymen could make. There they lie, those valiant warriors of a false faith and of a fallen domination, their only history preserved by their conquerors, their only monuments, their bones, and these the drifting sand of the desert will bury in a few short years. Three days before, I had seen them rise, eager, confident, resolved. The roar of their shouting had swelled like the surf on a rocky shore. The flashing of their blades and points had displayed their numbers, their vitality, their ferocity. They were confident in their strength, in their justice of their cause, in the support of their religion. Now, only the heaps of corruption in the plain and fugitives dispersed and scattered into the wilderness remained. The terrible machinery of scientific war had done its work. The dervish host was scattered and destroyed. Their end, however, only anticipates that of the victors. For time, which laughs at science, as science laughs at valor, will in due course contemptuously brush both combatants away. <laughs>